don't know if you've read the news, HP announced that they will be cutting 25 to 30,000 jobs. HP, this great company that started out as part of Silicon Valley, right across the street from Stanford University, who thought that they were the top of the game in terms of science and invention and new ideas, nobody knows what to do with an HP anymore. Printing is going away, enterprise technology is going away, and they didn't keep up. And so now they're dividing the company in half, parts of it will go away. That type of activity is happening with company after company who is not plugged in to understand how fast and how dynamic the future of the workplace is going to be. And if we go even further, we can see the prediction is that by the year 2027, up to 75% of the S&P companies that we currently see on the list today will have been replaced. That is how fast how things are changing. That means 75% potentially of your clients will not be around. And the question is, are you helping them to make that change? Are you helping enable them, telling them what the change looks like? Or are you simply riding on their coattails, hoping you can hold on to the next horse, no matter where it's going to be as we, as we go forward? We also take a look at what CEOs are telling us, and they are scared about their new competitor. Half of uh, 1,322 CEOs polled said that they believe their next competitor will be a technology company they've never heard of. It goes earlier to what somebody mentioned in which IBM is saying, hey, we'll start our own agency because we can do it better. We're IBM, we have access to data, we have access to customers, we know deep psychographics, so we actually can make a play that may be better than the agencies out there. Adjacencies and organizations are gonna come at us from every end, and it's not only this industry, but every industry is facing competitive nature from adjacencies of organizations, many of which have roots in technology. And if you don't think that your next competitor is going to be a Google or a Facebook or with respect to the folks in the room, a LinkedIn, then you are misguided because those organizations, while they may play today to be your partner, also are making a play to be your replacement one day. So that type of disruption is happening very, very quickly and it means that we have to understand it. We have to understand what is the current mission of Facebook. So, just as a quick example, does anybody here in the room know what is the mission statement of Facebook? Because they are your next competitor. They are the company that means to take over what you do. If you don't know the current mission statement, if you don't know the current 2015 strategic objectives of a company like Facebook or Google or LinkedIn, you're missing out on the next disruptor to your organization and your business. That is how fast things are changing. And in the past, we had this whole concept called barrier to entry. Barrier to entries have been disbanded. That concept shouldn't even exist anymore because technology, mindset, globalization now create no barrier to entry. But we kind of hope that would be. Our uh, baby boomer leaders in the past would hope that we could hold on to a brand new idea, get out in front in the marketplace, and hold on to it for 20 to 25 years. Today, you're lucky, as the research shows, you're lucky to be around with your own brand name for 15 years or more. That is how fast things are changing. And the amazing thing is that we know why this is happening, because a lot of the current principles around the workplace today, once again, were invented back in the times of factories, but they no longer work. And to be even more frightening, they were perpetuated in our education model. Universities are set up for the very nature of being able to create leaders that would go into those factories and get people to do the same thing over and over again. And so today, even in America, across the world, we have universities whose primary nature is to put a whole bunch of people into a class, teach them one thing, getting them all to grade and mark on the exact same result, and then we get them into the workplace and we expect individuals to be creative, thinking outside of the box, doing things differently. So the university systems are also about to be majorly disrupted. We've seen the first example happen in the United States where AT&T has partnered with the University of Georgia to sponsor a complete degree. So the concept is you show up to that university, you follow the curriculum of AT&T, and when you are done, you get a job in a leadership role with AT&T. They designed the curriculum. 
that is going to continue. We will see nano degrees, we will see nano universities pop up, and this old traditional style of us showing up into a large room with a hundred other people, learning the same thing over and over again, hoping that we'll be creative individuals after we're done, goes away in the future. We we're worried about the skill capabilities. As, as we've heard earlier today, the gap between what we need and what we have today will be amazing. In the United States, it's surprising today that the largest number of jobs in the future will come with the requirement of computer skills. Yet in the US, 79% of our high school education um, of our schools teach no computer science. We have this big gap between a perspective of where things are going to be going and where we're at today. And, and when we start to look at the skills gap, it becomes even larger in terms of the capability of what we're looking for. This will create an all out war for talent. We've heard about this phrase, there have been books written about it, but it will be incumbent upon you to create an organization, to create a type of culture and an atmosphere in which people want to come work for you, in which you create a world that's inspiring and amazing so that people will come to work for you. Because if you don't, those best people, maybe even yourselves, will go away and work for other organizations. Or more interestingly, when we can't find the right kinds of people, we will, in increasingly, increasing numbers, turn to robotics. So the predictions are that by the year 2025, one third of existing jobs today will be replaced by robotics. How many people have been to a new robotic McDonald's yet? Uh, there's one in, they're doing some testing in Sydney down um, near Newtown um, of a new McDonald's in which you walk in and there are no people to take your orders anymore. It's all kiosks. We'll see, start to see more and more of those in the future and McDonald's is prototyping right now a machine in which they make the complete hamburger from end to end via a robot and the burgers taste better than what people can make because they get the right temperatures, they get the right ingredients, it's all perfectly made. And it's custom designed burger. You walk up, you punch in your burger exactly the way you want it, and a machine char grills the, per anyway. Um, maybe I'll go to McDonald's for the first time. Um, but robotics and, and what will happen in the future will replace if we're not ready for where the future of the workplace looks like. So we know that the disrupted workplace is getting exponential change. We've talked a lot about it today already. It'll keep growing in increasing numbers. The reality is, is that we now need new leadership to be able to help us with that. 62% of organizations today say that they have a leadership gap. They do not have the right leaders in place to be ready for the exponential change that is happening in the future. And when you ask CEOs about their current leadership development programs, only 9% of them say that they believe they're effective at even creating leaders for the future. When we take a look at some of the skills that we're going to be needing, how do you think about leading multiple generations in a change environment? That skill does not exist by many leaders today. How do you understand how to manage this exponential change where the world feels like it is completely moving around you? And as generations, we'll talk about that in a few minutes because some of us come from a generation in which we could sort of count on our foundation to be steady at least for a little bit of time. But the future doesn't look like that. The future is going to be that there will be constant change. So are we ready for that? Are you mentally prepared for what that's gonna look like in the future? When we take a look at the future, the research that we've shown show that there's actually um, seven different shifts that are taking place today all simultaneously. And these seven shifts are things that we'll go into detail later in this afternoon, or I'll also be able to send you more details around this with some PDFs that I have that I can tell you more about. But let me just highlight briefly those seven shifts, and then I'll give you some examples of some of these shifts and ask you, what are you doing to think about your preparedness for some of those? What are you doing to make sure your organization is ready? So first of all, we know the future is going to be fast, very, very fast. Each of you have to be asking yourselves, am I a fast leader? Am I using technology? Am I using decision making that's going to help me be a fast leader? We hear some discussion about slow world, slow times, but that is not the reality. The reality is that things are going to happen very, very quickly. We have to be nimble and ready for multitasking in terms of where the future is going. 
The second area that we know is really critical is the ability to be a digital leader. Some of us lean into the technology. Some of us are okay with mobile phones, but I can tell you the future is that you must incorporate digital technology. You must lean into the digital technology. And the reality is that if you think, I, I, as we start to work with executives, some of the executive teams that I work with in large organizations, I sat across from desks of leaders who have said, you know what, Rick, I've got an iPad, and they do. It's sitting on the corner of their desk. It looks like a nice little trophy, so they can say they've got an iPad. But they rarely pull out that iPad. They rarely understand what they need to do to use that mobile technology in the day-to-day -day running of their business and organization. And as I talk to those individuals, the reality is, they, I ask them, how long are you planning on being around planet Earth? Just as we heard a little bit more this morning, the reality is that many of us will live to between 83 and 87 years old if you are 50 and above, and even longer if you're under 50 currently today. That means that if you're just going to sort of dodge out of using the technology, you will miss out on a whole part of life in the future that will be technology or digitally enabled. So the real test, for example, is, and I'm guilty of it myself as a Generation Xer, is how much do you incorporate this into your day-to-day -day business? More iPads or phablets are sold today than laptops because that is the future of where this is going. Apple just announced a larger version of their iPad, which they believe will come along and mostly replace people's use of even laptops. So how much do you do that? How many of you today, and I looked around earlier, um, I won't look again, but how many today are taking notes from this conversation on a mobile device as compared to using pen and paper? That tells me, that's my sign to myself, whether or not I have become so used to this as my primary way of interacting with capturing data, working with data, et cetera, et cetera. Some of you may write things down and then use your Evernote or Snap uh, scans to go along and take pictures of it and then digitally convert it. Perhaps you're on your way. But we have to really think about what are we doing to be digitally enabled and ready for the future. Number three, we have to think about as leaders how we understand what I call the on-demand future. So we have seen it come along. The reality is, is that in the future, every consumer, every individual will look at life as something that is on demand. I want things when I want them, not when companies tell me they want me to have them. So in the future, we will just simply expect that anything that a person wants will come when they want it. If our companies, if our organizations do anything to create a barrier between that demand, then they will be obsolete and they will be eliminated. Let me give you examples. Today in, uh, we all know about Amazon. You can get Amazon here in Australia. That's expanding. Baidu is, is really growing in uh, China. Today, uh, where I live in Silicon Valley as well as San Diego, you can get on to a new service called Amazon Prime Fresh. And in Amazon Prime Fresh, I can order my groceries in the morning and Amazon will deliver them in the afternoon. That is on demand. That will be the expectation. As more and more of that innovation comes into play, consumers will now expect on demand when I want what I want when I want it. Therefore, the question is, how do we think about enabling our businesses and organizations to get ready for that? As leaders, how do we think about that with each of our organizations? That means, for example, if there's information that you provide as part of your service, do your customers and clients, are they able to get that information on demand when they want it? Or are you still working in a, tell me what you need, I'll work on it, I put it behind firewalls, you have to give me certain things before I get it. If you continue to operate in that way, your customers, consumers will eventually simply go around you. And we'll talk about that in terms of generational dynamics in the future. We also understand that the world is becoming even more and more connected. We've heard about different ways in which social technology are coming into play. But the reality is that the new generation is very well connected to each other. Millennials today, let, let's do a quick, quick test here. Um, we're going to talk about generations in a few minutes and find out what we have in the room. But on the average, how many people in your Rolodex 
uh, in your address list on your phones, are you in connection with, on average, each year for at least one time? How many, what number would you come into play? How many people here would think that they've got at least 300 people that they are in connection with at least once a year? Okay, hopefully in this industry, it's pretty good, all right? That's the average for Generation X. Baby boomers are about 150, Generation X is about 300. We turn to the millennial generation and on average they have 1,200 connections that they reach out and are connected to every year. 4X the connection rate means that they influence differently, they think about how they interact with each other, they create connected worlds that are very important. So therefore, I think, yeah, there we go. Therefore, it begs the question, what are you doing to stay connected? And what are you doing to collaborate? And even more interestingly, what are you doing to influence? I heard a very interesting question earlier, which is, okay, I'm on LinkedIn and I pay the premium price. What do I do with that? Well, the answer is you influence. The world is about influence. Your cred rates in the future will be really important. Today, uh, anybody here uh, signed up and check your clout rating? Anybody on clout? K-L-O-U-T. If you are not on clout, go take a look at it. It's not a perfect world yet, but in the future, we will have clout ratings in which they go in and do aggregate scoring of your influencing capability on a combination of social sites like Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, they put those together and they give you a rating on how connected you are and therefore how influenced you are. And in the United States, top CMOs today cannot get a good job unless they have a great clout rating. Because if you think about marketing, it's all about your capability as a professional to influence. In the future, our credibility and our ability to influence will have greater and greater impact. So, do we start blogging about the things that we're passionate about? Yes, we should. Do we start placing that on places like LinkedIn or our own Twitter channels? We should. How many people here post something at least weekly on Twitter? Anybody? Oh, fantastic. One of the best that I've seen in the audience. I would expect that from this group. But there should be a whole lot more. And I'm not talking about going in and looking at Lindsay Lohan and what her latest escapades are. But the real question is, what are you going in to do to, number one, set up a LinkedIn list to go and look at other influencers in your industry. Do you know who they are? Do you know who's out there posting? How do you use Twitter to get feeds of knowledge and information that come into play around the decisions that you're making? Those are things that you have to do. How many people here have registered their .com or .com.au name for your family? So, www.vonfeldt.com. I've got it registered because in the future that will have cred and currency ratings. How many of you have done that? Why haven't the rest of you? That is like your family name on the internet, the most important valuable real estate that you could be having. You need to go off and register that today. You need to go onto YouTube and register your YouTube backslash family name because the future is going to be about video and your ability to have that presence. You should have your Twitter handle registered. And Today, for young couples, one of the most amazing gifts that you can give to a newborn child is to go in and register those names with those first and last names to those individuals. That is how important the future will be. We don't quite see it today, it doesn't make sense, but more and more that ability to influence and be interconnected through social media will be really important in the future. Number five is that we will all need to be a talent warrior. There is going to be, there is already today a battle for the best talent. We don't really realize it, but you probably all can each think about how much of your growth is impacted by not having 100% of the right people on your team today. What do you do to create an attractive environment? How many of you today have a branding about your organization, but not only your organization, maybe about the team that you represent? Can you go off and tell what's the purpose of your team? Why somebody would want to come and work on your organization or your team in such a way that people are inspired to want to join and be a part of that overall organization? We also th understand that number six as a shift is that we are becoming global players. We know that in Australia. I say a little bit we. Um, I've had the opportunity uh, working down in Sydney for the last year and a half for a company called Atlassian. 
And Atlassian is a new startup organization, one of the best place to work in Australia this last year. Great startup by two chaps who decided they didn't want to go to uni, um, and they wanted to be able to wear sandals, have t-shirts, hire their friends, and have fun at work. What a bad place, huh? They have skyrocketed to be one of the top entrepreneurs. They're pre-IPO, and uh, it's estimated that their company will IPO for $3.3 billion either this fall or next spring. As a part, if you haven't read about the Atlassian story, definitely interesting to look at. What's important about Atlassian is they're an example of an Australian company that is focusing on understanding global workforces. They have 1,800 people from around the world. They understand what they're doing and what they're going to focus on for the future, and they focus on the values in their organization going forward. And also, we have to also understand that the world is moving into urban environments. Long gone are the days when we, as different generations, would only work in different places in the suburbs. Young people want to move back in. Millennials want to move back into the cities, and we're creating this new urban environment. And then lastly, we have to understand the impact of being a multiples leader, a multiple generation. So when we wrote the book back four years ago called The 2020 Workplace, the reason we called it The 2020 Workplace is the culmination of what is happening in these next nine years. In those nine years, millions upon millions of baby boomers will be retiring and the millennial generation will rise into power as the dominant generation. And for the first time in over 150 years, the youngest generation in the workplace will be the largest number. It wasn't Generation Xers. In fact, we are half their size. So baby boomers will retire. Generation X comes into play. The question is, are we ready as Generation X? Generation X is sometimes called the Prince Charles generation because the mother queen has been leading and leading and leading, and Prince Charles has been waiting and waiting and waiting. And now even the UK is look, turning around, looking around, and saying, you know what? I don't know if Prince Charles is going to be the best leader for the future of the, U of the UK. What about William? What about Harry? So this afternoon, we'll talk a bit more about Generation X. Uh, many of those who are out there, if you were born between 1960 and 1980, you're Generation X. <laughs> You're in the middle of this big decision point in your career. Do I follow what I've been told for the last 20 years, waiting for my turn, following a style of leadership that all of a sudden has become questioned and obsolete? Or do I lean in towards this new millennial generation who will be 50% of the entire workforce by the year 2020? And that generation is coming along, and they are questioning everything. They're saying, why? Why do we have to do that? Why don't we make changes? Everything from how we work, where we work, to even very simple things like, why do we tuck our shirts in? Like, it doesn't make sense to stuff all of this material down into our pants. Why do we have to wear socks? Why do we have to do jackets? Why do we wear ties? Ties were invented 100 years ago to capture things falling out of mouths of people in factories. And now we've made it a fashion statement. Why? So this new generation comes along, questions everything, reinvents everything. They will lead in our growth and change in the workplace going forward. Large change is taking place. It's going to be an exciting place, I think, in the future. We have lots of thoughts, and I spend my time working with large organizations, leadership teams, to think about what does that future look like? How do we reimagine it? Um, and some folks are doing very well. Some are just sort of hiding their heads in the sand, hoping that it'll all go away very fast. Great, thank you. Round of applause. Thanks, Mike.